This video is sponsored by Shopify. Soft, cozy, sheep, shoe. Soft, cozy, sheep, shoe. Allbirds is listed as the world's most comfortable shoes and said to be more luxe than Yeezys. Valued at over 4 billion, a rarity in the footwear industry. Its shoes can be spotted on the feet of the biggest leaders in Silicon Valley, from Google's co-founder to Twitter's former CEO and a wide range of celebrities from Oprah Winfrey to former President Barack Obama. And it all started with a professional soccer player whose World Cup dreams were cut off before coming up with the idea behind Allbirds. Not knowing anything about shoes, it would take 200 prototypes and dodging a questionable deal for the company to take flight. In 1981, Tim Brown was born in Congleton, United Kingdom and raised in Wellington, New Zealand. His father worked with nonprofits and his mother was a nurse. From an early age, Tim found himself passionate about playing soccer. However, some family members were disappointed that he wasn't interested in New Zealand's national sport, rugby, instead. Still, Tim continued to play and told himself that he would die happy if he could make New Zealand's under-20 team. After graduating from high school, Tim received soccer scholarships from a number of colleges. He ended up choosing the University of Cincinnati since he began to develop an interest in design and saw it offered one of the best programs. Tim's parents supported his decision and even got a loan against their home to ensure he wouldn't run into financial issues. The University of Cincinnati's design program was an intense five-year commitment. Tim found himself struggling to balance both his studies and playing soccer for the university, since it involved practicing 40 hours a week and the field was located opposite from his classes. Eventually, Tim begged his coach to allow him to miss warm up so he didn't have to leave class early for practice. When I look back on it, I, it was a fair amount of pressure, but I, I'd found something that I was in love with. After graduating from university, Tim was recruited by the Newcastle Jets in Newcastle, Australia. But within less than a year, he joined the Wellington Phoenix in Wellington, New Zealand. Tim was a midfielder and wasn't the quickest or most technical player. In fact, he often got penalties and was red carded. However, Tim was good at throwing off opponents, getting the ball away from them and giving it to the better players on his team. He also continuously tried to improve his skills since he believed his team would one day have a shot at the FIFA World Cup. That was the, the special source that drove me to kind of get through the, the humdrum, you know, routine of professional sport. Around this time, Tim got a sponsorship deal with a major sportswear company, which he refuses to name. What was supposed to be an exciting moment in his career ended up being a dreadful experience. Growing up, Tim watched his father remove logos off his clothes since he was a minimalist, a habit that Tim picked up and became even more ingrained in him while studying design. He hated having to wear clothes and shoes plastered with logos because of his sponsorship deal. Eventually, Tim began to wonder why there wasn't a major sportswear company offering shoes that had no logos and were comfortable. It bothered him so much that he decided to try and make his own. Whenever he had free time, he would think about the design and material and look up factories in New Zealand online. But after realizing all the factories ceased operations due to the industry shifting to Asia, Tim settled on one in Indonesia and even traveled there when he had a month off from soccer. At the same time, he and his team were still focused on qualifying for the World Cup. After Tim's trip to the factory in Indonesia, he placed an order for the kind of shoes he'd always envisioned for himself. However, he soon regretted his decision. Since the shoes were made with canvas and leather, Tim had to visit a tannery for the first time and quickly realize how many toxic chemicals go into making the material. By then, it was too late to cancel his order and he was stuck with 1,000 pairs. Fortunately, Tim's brother helped to sell some at a pop-up shop and Tim's roommates bought a few as well. And while many resonated with the concept of simple, unbranded and comfortable shoes, Tim felt they needed to be differentiated in a bigger way. An idea would soon come unexpectedly.
Enjoying the video so far? Be sure to subscribe to Hook and ring the bell to stay up to date with news stories about today's most successful companies. One day, Tim was reading a magazine about the merino sheep wool industry in New Zealand. It had always been an iconic part of the country's history and known as the finest in the world, but it began to suffer from being less in demand in favor of cheaper and synthetic materials. Knowing merino was a miracle fiber with many natural, renewable, and biodegradable benefits, Tim wondered why it was never once used on shoes. What if we could do that? He thought to himself. That would be huge. Following his instincts, Tim submitted a grant proposal to develop a wool fabric for shoes to a funding board that was looking for new ideas to keep the wool industry alive. Later that year, Tim won $200,000 from the funding board and a contracted research lab began to work on developing a wool fabric for shoes. Soon after, Tim received news that changed his life in an instant. New Zealand qualified for the 2010 World Cup, marking the second time in history the country entered the competition. Tim was selected to play both as a vice captain and midfielder, but a sudden turn of events would force him to sit on the sidelines. Leading up to the World Cup, New Zealand, nicknamed the All Whites, played a warm-up match against Australia. During the first half, Tim found himself tangled with competing player Vince Grella as they both chased the ball, leading to Tim falling to the ground. As Tim put his hand down to support himself, Vince fell on top of Tim, injuring Tim's right shoulder. Tim played on and only went to the hospital after interval. After getting a CT scan, the doctors discovered he had fractured his shoulder and would need surgery immediately. Two weeks after the operation, Tim made a miraculous recovery and was cleared by medical staff to head to South Africa for the World Cup. Still, Tim was never given the chance to step onto the field. Instead, he looked on as his teammates drew 1-1 one -one against Slovakia and then Italy, proving the All Whites weren't the World Cup's biggest dud like the Wall Street Journal claimed. But in spite of the All Whites' impressive performance, they were sent home just days later after a scoreless draw against Paraguay. Their journey to the World Cup was over. I realized like this, that's the end that's of this. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is the, the moment where I uh, depart. Two years later, Tim was finally able to hang up his cleats and announced his retirement from professional soccer. Afterward, he decided to apply to LSE's International Management Master's program, thinking a business education would complement his undergraduate degree in design. LSE didn't exactly see Tim as a potential star student and suggested he take a class to improve his calculus skills. Tim followed their advice. Afterward, LSE finally took a chance on Tim. After a couple of semesters at LSE, Tim headed to Northwestern University for an eight-week entrepreneurship course as an elective. There, the professor and former CEO of Walmart.com, Carter Cass, instructed students to pitch a business idea in under three minutes. Following, the class would form teams around the best ideas to execute them for the remainder of the course. Tim decided to pitch his idea of creating shoes with merino wool. How is it possible to turn scratchy wool into shoes? Tim's classmates questioned. Tim explained that wool from merino sheep was different. Its fibers were incredibly soft and comfortable and could wick away moisture and regulate temperature. While some classmates began to open up to the idea, others laughed. Tim's professor even pulled Tim aside to tell him his idea was horrible. Throw this out on Kickstarter so it can quickly fail and you can get on with your life, he instructed. After the Northwestern course ended and Tim graduated from LSE, Tim created 200 prototypes before settling on a design. Afterward, he forged ahead with facing his fears and setting up a Kickstarter campaign. To kick off the launch, Tim decided to shoot a promotional video at a family friend's farm in New Zealand. When Tim arrived, the family friend herded the sheep together so that they could be in the backdrop. At that moment, Tim began to have doubts. This is dumb, he admitted to his brother. 
Just do it, his brother insisted while dragging him to the farm. What's the worst that could happen? Tim reluctantly obliged and moved forward with the shoot. Later that year, Tim's Kickstarter campaign went live, introducing his shoes as the world's first merino wool runners as 3 over 7. The campaign highlighted the shoes' natural, renewable, and biodegradable benefits, including being machine washable. Anyone who pledged $98 or more to back the project would receive a pair. Tim had hoped to raise $30,000 within 30 days, but reached that goal within the first day. And just three days later, the amount rose to almost $120,000. Tim was then forced to shut down the campaign since he didn't have enough wool to make shoes for more Kickstarter customers. On the outside, it had seemed Tim achieved major success. But on the inside, Tim felt otherwise. He still wasn't sure how exactly the shoes could be made in spite of contracting a factory in Portugal. I remember being scared. I was like, we have to go deliver on this now and, um, and execute it and, and, um, and this is going to be really, really hard. Tim wasted no time in trying to figure things out like production, but found himself running into one challenge after another. The factory he contracted had made the men's and women's shoes the same size and then suddenly went bankrupt. Tim had no choice but to send what he had to his Kickstarter customers and then fly to Portugal to rescue the remaining wool, tapping into his savings that were now drying up. Tim then began to question if his idea for wool shoes was still worth pursuing. It didn't help that his father began to refer to him as a cobbler, and his circle of friends didn't take him seriously. We'd go out for dinner and we'd go around the table, and I would, I just, I would dread when it would come to me and people would ask what I was doing. Mm. My body would curl up into a little ball and I would sort of say, wool shoes, and when we'd leave the dinner, people would pat me on the head and say, that's, it's lovely that you're pursuing this little thing, and good luck with that little fella, and it was just, it was, it was awful. Unbeknownst to Tim, he would soon receive an offer that would lead to turning his venture into a billion dollar company, a rarity in the footwear industry. One day, Tim received an unexpected call from an investor who had just learned about his merino wool shoes. He was impressed by the idea and Kickstarter traction and asked him if he could invest. Tim agreed to consider his offer and hopped on a plane to meet him in New York. During the visit, the investor took his time to walk Tim through the details of his offer. However, he only gave Tim two weeks to make a decision. Tim was unsure about what to do. The deal would relieve him from financial stress, but it would leave him with only a small stake in his own venture. You need to speak with Joey about this, Tim's partner Lindsay suggested. He comes from this world and he's one of your customers. Joey was Lindsay's best friend's husband who consulted for management and investment firms before running a biotech startup in San Francisco. Tim took Lindsay's advice and reached out to Joey. While some of Tim's friends took a look at the deal, Joey thoroughly reviewed the terms. It was vulturous in the way I read it. And I, th I thought that it was taking advantage of a great idea and trying to sink their talons into this business and what Tim would have been left with was not great. Joey advised him to not take the deal and suggested an alternative to help his venture succeed, becoming partners. At the time, Joey was researching sustainable clothing materials and pitching them to multinational brands. Many of them were excited by his ideas, but never followed through since they preferred to do things the cheaper old way. Joey became extremely frustrated, especially after realizing that even a struggling venture like Tim's dared to do things differently and better. In the US alone, the average American buys eight pairs of shoes a year, most of which are made with toxic chemicals that cannot be recycled and end up in landfills. Meanwhile, Tim's shoes were biodegradable since wool is a natural material. Really resonated with me from a sustainability perspective, but it was also about an opportunity to sell shoes in a totally different way than the industry had, had ever done before. For both Tim and Joey, 
It was obvious that there was the potential to become great partners given their many similarities in attitude and approach. So after spending an entire weekend getting to know each other better, they decided to make it official and become co-CEOs. Tim then moved to San Francisco to work alongside Joey in his mother-in-law's garage. That same year, Tim and Joey managed to find a textile mill to produce a high-quality, certified sustainable wool fabric and a factory operating within one of the cleanest electric grids in the world. Later, the two even secured a $2.8 million investment from Great Oaks Venture Capital. Tim and Joey then rebranded their joint venture as Allbirds, a nod to New Zealand since its first settlers described it as a land of all birds when they first arrived. Next, they decided to build their website and sell directly to consumers online through the sponsor of this video, Shopify, an easy to use and affordable commerce platform that allows anyone to set up an online store, regardless of technical or designability and experience. Direct to consumer as a concept has been around for a while. Sure. But the technology has developed. And so it, it allowed us to take advantage of things quite inexpensively from, from that infrastructure. Within just seven months, Allbirds managed to officially launch its website, offering its first line of shoes called the Wool Runners. After a week and a half, the shoes were already sold out. And by the end of the month, Allbirds brought in 1 million in sales. Over the next year, Allbirds took the world by storm. Times Magazine listed Allbirds wool runners as the most comfortable shoes in the world, and Forbes described them as more luxe than Yeezys, since its wool is the same level of quality used for brands like Gucci, Giorgio Armani, and Tom Ford. New York Times then dubbed Allbirds as Silicon Valley's cobblers, given it was being worn by the likes of Google's co-founder, Twitter's former CEO, and venture capitalists. Following, CNBC highlighted the Allbirds trend expanded into mainstream fashion as it was spotted on celebrities like Oprah Winfrey, Gwyneth Paltrow, and even former President Barack Obama. By then, Allbirds had raised an additional 2.7 million from Lear Hippo Ventures, 7.3 million from Maveron, and 17.5 million from Tiger Global Management. And only one year later, Allbirds secured an additional $50 million from T. Rowe Price at $1.4 billion valuation, placing the company in the Unicorn Club. Today, Allbirds is valued at over $4 billion and remains committed to doing business differently through being a certified B Corp, labeling its carbon footprint, and offering innovative and sustainable materials beyond wool, leading to a line of shoes made with eucalyptus called Tree and another line made with sugarcane called Sweet Foam. Times Magazine even listed Sweet Foam as one of the best inventions that could help save the world since it replaces the need to use EVA, a common synthetic material used in shoes that's considered carcinogenic and a developmental toxin. On top of that, Allbirds has made the materials open source so that others could use them, leading to collaborations with competitors who realize the demand for natural materials like Nike and Adidas. Allbirds also continues to sell directly to consumers through Shopify, but has opened stores in the US, New Zealand, UK, Netherlands, Germany, China, Japan, and South Korea. As for Tim and Joey, the two continue to work together as co-CEOs and prioritize managing their working relationship just as much as the business strategy. In an interview with NPR, Joey shares whether or not their success is the result of luck or skill and hard work. I think they're, they're inextricably linked. I've always thought of luck as some random event happening to you. But that happens, and then what are you going to do with it? And I think we've had the good fortune together to, to have great timing across a whole host of things. Like we could start a business and put up a website in seven months and reach 10,000 people in a week. But we also seized and capitalized on that opportunity and we worked super hard and made some good decisions along the way to turn that luck into something that was really positive. This is the story of how two men from very different backgrounds partnered up to create a billion dollar shoe company leading the footwear industry. 
If you're inspired to build a successful business of your own like Tim and Joey, you can go to shopify.com forward slash hook to find ideas and start with a free 14-day trial. And for more inspiring stories, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.